sweet midge is uh, one of the best examples of why a producer should not plant canola on canola. Canola School on RealAgriculture.com is brought to you by Alberta Canola Producers Commission, SAS Canola, and Manitoba Canola Growers. So I'm here with Julie Soroka, a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And is it true that you guys found sweet midge in northeastern Saskatchewan this year? Sweet midge symptoms and the larva were readily apparent throughout a very um, significant area in the northeast of the province. And this isn't the first time sweet midge have been found in Saskatchewan or uh, symptomology has been. It was in 2007 they were first identified here. That's correct. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency had a series of uh, pheromone traps set out throughout Western Canada to monitor the insect and it uh, positive trap results were found from Saskatchewan in three locations in, in 2007. Will they be able to continue reproducing here? My colleague Owen Alford has run models of the biology of the Swede midge and the climatic uh, regions across Western Canada and found that the, the midge can in all likelihood survive quite well here. The midge prefers warm and moist conditions and such conditions are uh, highly favorable to its development. It was first identified and found in southern Ontario in 2000 and since then it has proliferated in that region because of the temperature and moisture conditions. However, even under the cooler and drier conditions of Western Canada, it can survive and as we've seen in the last two years, it's doing quite well. Okay, so this is the first time we've ever heard of Swede Mint. Can you take us through the life cycle and let us get All right. to know the insect a little bit better? I can do that, Deborah. The Swede midge is a Cessodomyid, which means it is in the fly family Cessodomyidae. These are the fairy midges. They are very uh, delicate insects. The Swede midge is related to wheat midge or brome grass seed midge or, or, or Hessian fly, but it is it has several distinctions from these uh, insects that I've mentioned. It is only a pest of crucifers, including the coal crops, the vegetable crops, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, and field crops such as canola or mustard. It also has several generations a year, unlike wheat midge or some of the other midges, and it can proliferate very rapidly. It is about the same color as a mosquito, but it is much smaller and adults are very difficult to uh, see in the wild. It doesn't necessarily fly only in the early morning or late evening like wheat midge. In fact, it prefers to fly. It is, uh, adults are active during the day. They do not like very high temperatures, so they will uh, seek shelter in the heat of the day around one or two in the afternoon, but they will um, be active throughout the day otherwise. Um, are the adults feeding or is their primary goal just reproduction? They, their main aim is reproduction. In fact, the males can live less than a day. They, they have a life expectancy of 8 to 12 hours, so they're not very interested in, in feeding. Females, upon mating, will live about one to three days. They obviously have to lay eggs before they die. And where will they lay their eggs and what kind of populations will you see as a result of one female? The female will select rapidly growing sites of her host plant. So in canola, in, uh, during the vegetative state, um, apical meristem of the vegetative shoots, as the canola develops, the um, meristem or the buds of, of our flowering racine eventually flowers. If 
the female is around as uh, pods develop, she can actually lay into a developing flower and I have seen larvae in pods. So anything rapidly growing, high nitrogen, females are after a, uh, the best possible place for their larvae to emerge and feed. Um, so then the larvae will essentially eat inside whatever it was that they were laying in. Like That's pod. correct. Larvae do not move initially from the point where they are laid, uh, from, for, from the point where the eggs are laid. The maggots feed by uh, puke and slurp method. They eject enzymes into the growing tissue of the canola and this macerates or liquefies the plant tissue and then the larva can consume it uh, by slurping it up. But that um, salivary enzyme also changes the hormonal balance of the, of the plant and instead of developing normal structures, uh, severe abnormalities can result and uh, do result. What kind of signs and symptomology will we be looking for as a result of this feeding? Damage to canola depends entirely on when larvae emerge and start feeding. If you have damage very early, such as I've seen in the populations in Ontario, you can have, um, you can have stunted growth, you can have uh, delay or even um, non-development of bolting racemes. So you can have um, vegetative abnormalities. If you have feeding later on, you can have uh, abortion of bud. Still later on, you can have abortion of flowers. Later on, misshapen flowers, um, misshapen pots. If damage develops as the raceme, as the potting raceme is elongating, you can have severing of the, of the growing point and pod development that looks like a palm tree. All the pods uh, develop on a very short stalk. So it, what you see is dependent on when the plant is attacked. What we saw this summer most frequently and most readily identifiable was Flowers not opening. You have the sepals stuck together, the flower petals remain in that tight cluster, and the larvae feed quite happily, all enclosed. Larvae are gregarious. They have no qualms about feeding with all their sisters and brothers. I counted 43 larvae in one flower. And there's the potential for huge yield losses then. I have seen in Ontario uh, fields where no canola reached flowering, portions of fields where no canola reached flowering. Uh, in Saskatchewan, we've seen many uh, primary racemes with very few pods. Again, it depends on timing of infestation. If you have, canola is a very plastic crop and it, it tries to produce seed. So if it's uh, stymied at one time, it will try to uh, flower and produce healthy seed later on. Should farmers be monitoring for this insect? Well, every bit of knowledge helps in control of a pest. Producers should be aware of what sweet midge damage looks like, know the biology of the midge, and know what some of the symptoms look like. Infestation is most often from one infested field in the previous year to a nearby infested field in the current year. Farmers should be checking their canola stubble uh, and checking areas that were uh, close to canola stubble pre uh, last year. Um, are there any control strategies as of now? There are. I believe two uh, insecticides registered for sweet midge control in Canada. Unfortunately, we don't have any economic thresholds for uh, these for control of sweet midge in canola. So we're not quite sure when to use them. As well, the feeding and developmental pattern of the midge 
makes insecticide use less than an optimum strategy. The larvae feed in enclosed tissues. The adults are multi-generational. The first adult generation in the spring can have several flushes of, gener of, of emergence. So you can have all stages of the midge present at almost all times of the season. So, so it, hard to know when to spray. That's right. Right. Are there any other strategies then? Is crop rotation an option or seeding earlier like you were mentioning? Crop rotation works great in theory, but unfortunately we have such a tremendous area of canola grown on the prairies that it is um, not as useful as it could be perhaps in other jurisdictions. However, the midge is an extremely weak flyer. So if you could have an isolation from another canola field of say one or two miles or two, uh, two kilometers, um, it might be possible to limit your um, infestation. Seeding early is also beneficial. The bigger your canola is before the mid emerges and lays its eggs, the greater chance it has to developing normally. 